Let's take a look at today's case, which is one of the most infamous killers in Mexico. You mind? Our story starts back in late 1950. There's a woman and her name is Juana. And Juana was born in Hidalgo, Mexico. When she was born, her mother didn't really care about her education. This happens to a lot of kids, especially in the 1950s in Mexico, especially the 1950s anywhere. But Juana's mother was very particular. She didn't give a sh about Juana's education. And she made sure that she was aware of that. Juana's mom was pretty abusive and told her exactly how she felt all the time. Juana never went to school and she never learned how to read or write. It made her feel incredibly hopeless, like her life would never go anywhere because she didn't even have the basic tools to read what was in front of her. I can't imagine how insecure that would make a child feel when they can't read and then nobody values their education at all. Her mom, her name was Justa and she was an addict and she was also a sex worker but she settled down at one point with this guy named Trinidad. When Justa settled down with Trinidad and had Juana, I don't know what the deal was, but Justa was convinced that Trinidad was gonna be a good dad. Maybe, I don't know, cause he had the word dad in his name or maybe she was just drunk all the time and didn't really think about it, maybe he was. Justa was a severe alcoholic and Trinidad had fathered 32 children. There was no way that this man was staying for the long haul. It's not, you know, 32 is the ticket, 32 times the charm. This guy was leaving no matter what, or Justa was gonna leave. And three months after Juana was born, she left. So Juana can't read or write, and she's living in this home with her severely alcoholic mother. Severely alcoholic. And I wanna take a minute just to mention this, because, you know, here in America, I feel like we always see advertisements about liquor. Every party we go to, there's alcohol. It's kind of portrayed to us that we need alcohol to loosen up and have fun. But I wanna be very firm. Alcohol is an addictive substance. It is an addictive, mind-altering substance that has been marketed to us and you must use it in moderation. But just as mom is a severe alcoholic, she is always drunk never connects with Juana, never talks to her, beats her, lashes out on her, and does anything that she wants, basically. When Juana came home one day, when she was about 13 years old, her mother isn't yelling at her on this day. She doesn't beat her. She's a little more tired than usual. She tells Juana that she's gonna go with Jose today. And Jose was a guy that would always kind of like hang out around the house. It was one of Justa's friends, Juana's mom's friends, but they were just drinking all the time together. Juana is like, what the fuck am I about to go with homeboy for? And her mom's like, come on, go, go, go. You're going with Jose, you're going with Jose. Juana listens to her mom, and then Jose takes three beers and gives them to Juana's mom, and then they leave. And Juana goes back to the house, and she's like, my mom's a piece of shit, but this isn't happening. She didn't just like give me away. So she sat there and she waited and she waited. She waited for her mom, her stepfather or somebody that she trusted, but nobody showed up. And then Jose tied her to his bed so that she couldn't leave. And nobody showed up for five years. And for those five years, Jose assaulted her repeatedly. He let his friends assault Juana repeatedly. And it wasn't until she had been gone for so long and people weren't believing Juana's mom's story anymore. And they went on a search to figure out where is this child? So finally, when she was about 16 or 17 years old, her family members start looking for her and they find her. At this point, Juana is all kinds of fucked up. Jose had gotten her pregnant when she was 13 and she miscarried. And then he got her pregnant again when she was 16 and she miscarried. But now she's finally out of his clutches and she's back. And it actually turned out that the mother had lied to the entire family. And she told them all that Juana had left with her 
of her own free will. She had convinced everyone in the family that Juana was at the house showing herself off to my friend Jose and then they just ran off together and I haven't seen her since. That's what Juana's mom told everyone. When she gets back and she hears this story, she is infuriated. I can't imagine that, you know? It's like, where, like where, is, where are the good parts of Juana's life? Where are they? She lives there for a little bit, but it was, at it was in 1980, actually, that uh, Juana's mom kicks the bucket. Cirrhosis of the liver. She died in, I think she died in her early 40s or something like that. Sitting out here drinking that gut rot shit every day. That's exactly what it'll do to me. Look, y'all out here, if anybody out here drinking these $5 bottles of wine, you got some $6 bottles of liquor, that is going to burn your shit up. Stop drinking, drop the bottle. Anyways, Juana said, mom's dead. Fuck this, I'm getting out. And she moves to Mexico City. <laughs> In the 80s and the 90s, she had a couple of different jobs. I thought this was really interesting. She was a luchador. She was five foot seven, and she comes to Mexico City to beat some ass. I mean, and I get it. She's pissed about her past with her mom. So she has found this healthy physical outlet for her anger where she's beating people up and feeling powerful, and then afterwards, she's celebrated for her power. For a child that has felt voiceless and powerless for so long, this is a good gig. She works a couple of like different jobs, but her main one is she really likes the wrestling job, okay? She called herself La Dama del Silencio. It's called Lady of Silence. Juana was very shy in nature outwardly. She was very, very nice, but obviously she had a lot of anger towards her mother. I'm sure y'all get it. The job was very empowering, but Juana only received about 20 bucks per win. She would get like 300 to 500 pesos. And then she also started stealing from shops and like burglarizing people's homes. She had a friend that kind of got her into it. And then in fact, that friend, you know, fucked her over and later on tried to extort her. And she's robbing these houses and whatnot. And you know, she's still doing the business. She's not doing it with her friend anymore. But the, the big thing is, although Juana isn't necessarily the demographic, she has to be careful because there's a person running around Mexico murdering elderly women. Here's the deal, okay? Back in night, like the late 90s, about 1998, there's murders in Mexico that are rapidly increasing. The weird thing about it is they're all old ladies, all of them, okay? They don't understand exactly what's going on. And, and once people's grandmas start dying, the abuelas, they got the abuelas, okay? Once people's grandmas started dying and shit, the whole city of Mexico, Mexico City is like, y'all gotta fucking get this dude, bro. Y'all gotta get this person, the abuelas. And so the police, you know, the police come out, the chief prosecutor, he comes out, he's gotta make a statement. And he's like, we're dealing with a very, very, very serious criminal here. We suspect that they've got multiple victims, got a brilliant mind, he's clever, he's careful. That's usually what the investigators say when they don't know who fucking did it. You know, it's, it's easier for them to say that the person's real smart instead of saying, okay guys, we don't fucking know who it is yet. Give us a minute, you know? So a couple details for you guys. The killer had somehow gained access to the women's homes. There was no signs of breaking or entry. It seemed like all of the women had just let them inside. And it also appeared like the crimes were not premeditated. Sometimes this person, the, he would like use things that were around the house. In forensic psychology, people would categorize this as a disorganized crime. A disorganized crime basically means that there's elements at the scene of the crime that imply that this murder was unplanned. So that helps us create a psychological profile of who we're dealing with. Impulse killer, somebody that is rageful and just snaps at a minute, you know, that, that's kind of what they do. When we have multiple disorganized crimes, it seems like someone who's just snapping, right? So they're kind of building this full profile for who this guy is, but one weird thing about it, and this is weird to the police because they're trying to find a motive, they realize that none of the women have been assaulted. They've been robbed, but they've been murdered. You don't have to murder somebody to rob them, you know? And it almost seemed like the killer was just taking a few trinkets, not robbing them blind. They couldn't figure out who's doing this. And when they can't figure it out, 
and there's a bunch of dead grandmas, the press goes wild. It was everywhere, all over the papers, because y'all already know, 70s, 80s, 90s, they love to headline stuff with salacious murder because that's the only way they're going to sell the papers. You know what I mean? They try to just put out whatever about the case, whether it's true or not. And then, of course, what do they do? Give him a cool name. They called him El Mada VS. <laughs> I can't say it! El El Mada VS. Okay, it's the old lady killer. Fuck it, all right? It's, it, they call him the old lady killer. His first victim was this woman named Maria Gonzalez. She was an elderly woman that lived alone. That's another thing too. I'm trying to help y'all build a profile. They all live alone. The man had gained access to Maria's apartment seemingly like of her own free will. Like she had definitely let him in for some reason. Or maybe the killer knew Maria. Here's the other thing too. I don't really have a morbid curiosity, but for covering these cases, I try to look at the crime scene photos because they tell so much. So I went and these crime scene photos are up and holy fucking shit, bro. The Abuelas! <laughs> bro, this man, okay, so his first victim, if you look at like the photos of all the scenes, these women, they had been beaten, their noses were bleeding, there was an extreme amount of blood coming like out of their mouths. And in this particular one, this man had, it looked like he had hit her head on something and knocked her out. And then afterwards, he strangled her with his bare fucking hands. They start putting this out everywhere, okay? They, they get multiple eyewitness descriptions and all this thing. But the eyewitnesses say something very, very interesting. Some of the people say, that the man was wearing women's clothes. But then some people say he wasn't. Some people say that he was burly and big and strong. The police don't really know what to do with this. And they're like, wait, we've got an idea. So the police in Mexico City rounded up every single trans person that they could and started interrogating everyone. They make this big statement that they say that the killer must be transsexual or he must be cross-dressing or something of that nature. And then they start picking up anyone who seems like they're a prostitute or anyone that's like cross-dressing or anything. They start picking up all these people. They pick up an interview over 49 trans people and all of them were cleared. And they're back to square one. There are so many victims at this point. March 2nd, Guillermina Orpeza, found manually strangled. July 25th, Marina Cortina, 86, strangled with a cord. October 9th, Maria Guadalupe Morales, 87 years old, fractured arms, tied up, strangled with somebody's bare hands. May 24th, Guadalupe Gonzalez, 74 years old. She was beaten. She was slammed into a wall and then strangled with two cords inside of her own home. All of these women were murdered and robbed. And over the course of a couple of years, they had racked up about 30 to 40 different bodies of these elderly women and they still haven't caught the person. Until July 25th, 2006. This tenant that was living at a woman's house named Ana Reyes, she was 82 years old. He's in his little apartment in the back house. He was just renting it out, you know? This lady was in her 80s, husband had passed away, she's living alone, she got some extra space. Shit, he said, I'm moving. He's coming out of his little apartment one day, and he sees this woman running out of Anna's house, and she's just fucking full speed, just booking it. Probably caught her attention at first because he was like, man, that bitch is fast. And then he looks over and Anna's front door is open, walks inside and she's dead. These people did not die. They did not, they were not left there. There was no chance of survival. This guy was choking him out until they died. And immediately the man yells for police. He just screams, Hell, and what you say now? The police were right down the street. I know y'all aren't gonna believe it. It's fucking true, Google it. This man walks in, finds a body, yells for help, calls for police, and they're right down the street. Well, the police are like, excuse me, I think I heard my name. And you know, as they hear police, this woman in white just runs past them really fast. And they're like, well, okay, we're needed over there. And this lady just ran by. 
well, let's get her and then let's go over there. So they apprehend the lady and then they go to the house and they find the body of Anna Reyes. It appears that we may have just caught the old lady killer, but not so fast. Seems that way, but we need to make sure. Could be a copycat, could be, you know, anything. And also the old lady killer is a man and this is a woman. And that woman happened to be Juana Barraza. <laughs> so the police keep her in custody in the car because this is a murder investigation. Well, word gets out pretty quickly in Mexico City that the old lady killer has possibly been caught. And get this, it's a woman. So the reporters pull up at the scene before they can even take Juana in for questioning. It was about 2.30 p.m. Not to mention Juana out here killing old ladies at fucking noon. Bro, she only been up for six hours. I said that because you know old people, they be getting up at 6 a.m. She literally just got up six hours ago and she killing people at noon. Reporters pull up and they're like, what happened? What happened? Wanda literally yells out the window, I did it. I'm the old lady killer. Oh shit. Okay. Well, within hours of her arrest, she was paraded by press, cameras, everything, interviews, and Wanda was eating it up. She was ready to talk to all these people. She was ready to tell them exactly why she did it. All of these women were basically surrogates acting as her mother. After her mother died at the age of 40, Wanda had a lot of justified rage. I will say that. She had a lot of justified rage and she couldn't take it out on her mother. Even though she had grown stronger and more powerful than her mother, she couldn't do anything because her mother was dead. So instead, she chose to kill her mother over and over and over and over again within the city of Mexico. Well, within Mexico City. Y'all know what I meant. As soon as she got picked up, she starts parading around town. They put her in front of the bus that the police created. This was the bus that the police made. That does not look like Juana. This looks like a Greek woman down here and then, and then up there. That's Juana. That's her. Juana Barraza in the flesh. She immediately starts doing interviews. She starts talking to whoever because she wants to tell her story. I can't help but think that this was probably like a release for Juana to finally tell everyone why she was so angry. But I can't help but think that she had to feel fucking stupid afterwards. You're so mad about this thing with your mom and you killed 40 people because you're mad at your mom. Okay, Ed Kemper. Come on, come on, dude. You know, I somebody in chat earlier said mommy issues. This is for sure mommy issues. In January of 2008, she was tried for over 30 of the murders, but she could only be connected and found guilty of 16 murders and 12 of the robberies. Afterwards, she was sentenced to 759 years in prison. She'll be eligible for parole in 2058. And by then, she'll be about 100 years old. You guys wanna see a little interview from her? It's in Spanish, but I can tell you what she said. Not because I speak Spanish, because I don't, but because I had a translator. She actually genuinely seems very ashamed. It's so interesting. It makes me wonder, now, yeah, Juana's right. She should never be forgiven for this. You murdered 40 people, well, 30 to 40, possibly. Can you guys imagine your grandma? The abuelas, don't kill my grandma. You can't take my grandma. Whoa. So that is the story. <laughs>